Hello, my name is Short Young. I'm also known as Aurensis, and I've been asked to go over my technique of making rocks again. So a couple of months ago in one of my previous videos, I've shown how I've built rocks uh, for my game Solus and how I combine those modeler rocks into entire caves. So basically I have rocks like these, they're very simple meshes, they're somewhat high poly, there's about three, four thousand triangles each, but they're otherwise very simple. And then what I do is I just copy paste these around until it forms caves. So let me take uh, this mesh instead, it's easy to work with. So basically you do like this, you copy it around a couple of times. And you're getting a cave, especially if you then also change the material, it gets even better. Some now grass grows on top, etc. So it's a very simple way of building caves. Now, for more information about how I'm building those and so on, please refer to one of my previous videos. I just want to quickly repeat the way I actually do this in 3D Studio Max on the request of several people. So I have an empty scene here in 3D Studio Max, and you can also do this with Modo, you can do it with Maya, you can do it with Blender, it doesn't really matter. What I'm about to do is very basic and very universal. Right, so I have an empty scene. I get myself a plane. So make a new simple plane. You can see it's about uh, this many triangles. I'm gonna make it rather dense, I would say. Not too dense either. You probably wanna tessellate it, subdivide it a bit more later on. So let's just say 64 or so, you know, something like this, which I'm doing in this panel here for people really new to Max. So let me show you that panel as well. Right, so you have this panel on your right, probably. Uh, and here you have the number of segments. Right, so then what I do is you need a texture. And what I have is, uh, I'm using some textures from gametextures.com. So I'm using this texture from Game Textures. It's a simple 2K texture, or not really a simple one, but it's a tiling rock texture. And it, you can of course also make these yourself, but most importantly, you need to have a height map for it. And that's key to doing this. So you need to have one of these things, the height map. The white pixels show the highest points, the black pixels show the lowest points. Um, it's best if you work in ZBrush, Modbox or anything like that. You can technically generate this as well elsewhere, but it's best if you get it out of that. So it's best if you sculpt a high poly and then you bake a height map out of it. Or you just buy one of these things like I did. I just bought this texture and that's it. So the diffuse I don't really need, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the height map I have and I'm gonna add it as a displacement on this one. So I'm gonna add to the modifier button here, I mean the modifier list, and I'm gonna add something called uh, displacement not displace mesh, there's a second one, simply called displace. Now it's very hard with this resolution though. Let me disconnect it again. Um, right, it's very difficult on a very small screen, but you have the resolution, uh, the bitmap here. So it's asking for a bitmap. I want to select the height map you just saw. So I'm going to be doing that. Like so. And then I'm going to set the strength to something like 150. Okay, rather not. So we're trying to find something that works strength-wise. So I basically have this. And that kind of works, because if I were to drag the texture on top of it as well, it would match the texture. You can see the depth of the mesh now matches the texture. You can see here is the one thing that sticks out kind of, 
and it also sticks out in the mesh now. So this kind of works. Uh, it's a rather low poly though, so I'm actually gonna, in between the plane and the displace, so actually before you displace, I'm gonna subdivide it a bit. So I can do a mesh smooth or so. Doesn't really matter how you do it. Any way you can make this denser. You could have actually just to increase the density also here. Do something that makes it denser. In my case, I'm adding a mesh mood and I'm setting this to classic and I'm going to do iteration, say two. That makes it a lot denser. And that also makes it match the shape more. That kind of works. It's too dense though. I mean, you can never use this in a game. So what I do then instead is I optimize it. Or rather, I let 3D Studio Max optimize it for me. There is one thing in here, all the way at the bottom here, called Pro Optimizer. That basically just reduces the number of triangles. So uh, my options look like this. It doesn't really matter. Actually, you can just take everything away. You can crunch borders. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing on here. Just to calculate. And then I'm going to say I want to have, uh, say, 2% of the original vertex count. That puts me at 2,500 faces. And then I have this instead. It's a bit low. So let's say uh, 5% maybe. So now I get this. I get basically this random looking thing. And it's quite, uh, maybe a bit more, 10%. So that's what I did for the original. Now it lost its textures. That's fine. And uh, you're getting quite a lot of artifacts, as you can see, right? You get all kinds of weird coloring and shading and all kinds of stuff. So after this step, next step I'm going to do is I'm going to add a relax. Now it's falling off the resolution here, but there's a modifier called re relax. See the name here, actually. And the reason why this went wrong, sorry, my bad. Uh, I put the pro optimizer underneath the displays. So that's obviously not a very good idea. It should be at above it. Sorry, rerunning it. So calculate again. And that looks actually a lot better than the previous one. And then I can actually reduce the triangle count a bit more. Right, so now I have this. Still, you're going to get some shading errors, less than before, but still some things are going to go wrong here and there. I don't immediately find the spot, but or maybe there. Like this one, for example, that's the problem. So there's a couple of those spots, and to be safe, we need a relax on top. So I added a relax to it. And you can just kind of see, that kind of smoothens it out. See, it makes it less extreme. I'm going to lower the intensity of that a little bit. Because I think if it's uh, the default 0 0.5 gets too smooth, it does need to be a little bit jaggy. And then what I have is this. So now I have a low poly mesh that fits the shape of the texture. The, the texture is still on top of the diffuse texture, but you can't see it anymore because this lost its UV coordinates. So I'm going to add a standard UVW map on top. And that's it. It's pretty much done already. So now you can see I have a low poly mesh that's matching the shape of the texture it's using. So I actually baked the mesh to the texture instead of the other way around. Right, so that I have. Um, I will collapse it all because there is sometimes a risk that the pro optimizer forgets what it did. And it kind of messes up the whole history stack, the whole, uh, all the modifiers. So to be safe, I'm just going to do right click, collapse all. So I have a simple one of these. Actually, I'm going to make it edit poly. So I added an edit poly instead of an edit mesh. And then I need to go to the next step. Now the next step is that I need to be able to take multiple of these meshes and easily push them into each other. I mean, they need to intersect. And it's kind of hard to do it with this mesh because the edges are so jaggy. And I mean, you're going to have cases where you can see into the meshes, right? So. I need to make sure it's easy to push these meshes into each other. And what I'm going to do about that is I'm going to select the border. So in the edit poly, I take border. I take the whole border that surrounds it. And uh, I enable soft selection. So to be clear, I now have this selected. I have all the edges surrounding it selected. Soft selection, use soft selection. Set the fall off to a number that makes it makes the color stop just around the edge, something like this, like they did. The outer couple of uh, polygons are selected, but nothing else is, or colored rather. And then I'm going to scale it. So I'm simply going to scale 
it almost flat, not entirely flat, but pretty much flat. And I'm going to pull it down a little bit. And then I'm probably going to increase the fall off and pull it down a bit more. So we do it in steps. Or perhaps even we could do, um, oh yeah, let's just increase this even more. We basically want the edge to be a little bit uh, rounded off. It has to go a little bit gradually up. Not too extreme, not too little either. I mean, you are going to get a little bit of stretching here on the edges by doing this. You can see there. But uh, the edges are almost never visible anyway. It's always about the central part. And it's about making this mesh easier to push into another piece. It's easier to do this now because the edge bends down. See? I do think, however, it's not enough yet. I know from experience that this is too little, uh, too little margin. So I'm also going to be adding an FFD box on top. So FFD box. I'm going to set the control points. This is kind of the same thing as we did with the edges, but a different way of doing it. I'm set setting the control points to, say, uh, 6, 6. The height doesn't matter. I make sure I select it, so I double-click it, so I'm, uh, I'm able to select these points. And what I'm going to do then is I'm going to select all the points surrounding it. So all the points at the outer edge. And I do the same thing again there. I scale it a little bit more flat and I pull it down. So you can see you now get this. And that's pretty much good enough. If you have to generate light map coordinates for your engine, like you have to for Unreal Engine 4 and 3, uh, you might want to do that now, this now, but otherwise it stands. I'm going to rotate it as well because it's uh, more of a rock wall. There we go. And then we want to have a lot of variations. And that's pretty much it. So I'm going to add an F another FFD box. I think it's too flat, for example. So I'm just going to select a bit here and there. Like pull this out a little bit. Pull that in a little bit. Kind of maybe pull forward the whole thing. I'm slightly distorting it, basically deforming it. So you get a bit more variation. And then you just start making more and more versions. So let's get another version next to it. So I'll just add a new FFT box and I'm going to say, okay, well, this version, maybe it should be more like bended almost. So, so now you do that, you know, and then you probably want another one that's like bended inwards instead of outwards. And maybe you even want to use the actual bend modifier. And you want to say, well, it should be 90 degrees, you know, Perhaps like this, perhaps inwards. And so on. And if you keep doing this, uh, then eventually you will have what I have here in the game, which is quite a lot of these meshes. I have about a hundred of these and they've all been made in the exact same way. And all the caves in the whole game they've been made in exactly the same way. So just pushing these kind of meshes together and as they intersect, you can barely see where they intersect. It's a very, very fast way of making lots of rock models. All of the models you see here, all of these pieces took me less than a day to do. And we can now build miles and miles of caves uh, at pretty much no cost at all. So it's a very quick way of doing it. I mean, it's very, very quick right now to just do this. You know, and we copy it and hey, we have something else and maybe this one is a bit more rotated. So perhaps you do this, you know, and maybe you can just rotate this around a bit. So now we already have a longer section. It's very forgiving. You can just intersect stuff. You can just rotate things. You can never see a seam. It's much better than an actual modeler system where you model the entire corridor and you have to neatly fit the meshes together because then you have to pay attention to exactly where you align it. You know, then you have to like nicely align the two pieces it's also going to look more generic because all the pieces are clearly the same looking and so on. This is very fast. And that's uh, pretty much my way of modeling rocks. And also, as you very briefly saw here, possibly is at the top, I also have these rock boulders. They've been done in exactly the same way, except that displacing a plane I displace the cube, I spherify the cube, and then I cut off the bottom half. So what I'm left with is a rock boulder like this. Again, it's the same thing, just a different shape. 
and for that matter we also have these and they too are done in the same way you take a cylinder you uh, displace the cylinder with cylindrical projection and then you use an FFD to push the middle of the cylinder, the central part, uh, inwards a bit so you get this kind of cone-like, pillar-like uh, shape. And that's it. It should also be noted that this works best with uh, textures that have a very clear depth perception. So it doesn't work very well with noisy, flat rock textures. You're going to need a texture that has a very strong uh, 3D feel to it. So the texture we have here is ideal for that, for example, because it has very clear shapes very clearly defined and thick, heavy shapes. So anything that does that is gonna work great. Anything that lacks that, it's pretty much just a, a flat gray rock wall or whatever color it is, that's not gonna work probably. You're not gonna get anything out of this technique doing that.